So today um, I'm going to be talking um, about my first book project, um, which is called Unruly Monuments Disrupting the State Through Delhi's Islamic Architecture. So um, what I'm presenting today is, is really kind of a macro idea, you know, kind of presentation of what the book is about. So um, even though each of the chapters goes into really kind of deep micro studies of, of spaces and so on, um, what I'm presenting today is more you know, the broader ideas and the themes that um, are concern the project. And I'll end with just a few snippets of what each of the chapters are about. So it's kind of a, a, a more macro overview of things. Um, OK, so on July 4, 2018, Therese Patricia Okumu climbed the Statue of Liberty to protest the US immigration policies and forced the shutdown of the monument, resulting in the removal of 4,500 tourists. Okumu used her body to claim the space of a national monument, which symbolizes inclusivity in order to challenge the state's exclusionary policies. And she also disrupted tourism, the form of experiencing monuments that the state authorizes. Um, historical monuments have been claimed as tools of nation building, through which um, you know, the state uh, shapes its glorious identity. Instead, I am trying to argue in the book that uh, monuments are precisely those spaces from where the power and authority of the nation state is actively questioned. Um, so instead of accepting that monuments hold the nation together, I'm trying to think about how when you examine them through the actions of non-elites at the site, through everyday micro-histories and popular imagery, rather than top-down narratives, how monuments challenge the very nation they're supposed to sustain. Um, so my <coughs> study of Delhi's Islamic architecture is unruly and unassimilable. Um, while the state tries to grasp and control its narrative, reveals this hypocrisy of the nation claiming success by declaring to be inclusive, but simultaneously excluding um, marginalized groups. So I'm examining how Delhi's Islamic architecture, some of which you can see on the screen, um, dating from the 12th to the 17th centuries, became modern monuments, were assimilated into the archive of public imaginary as uh, spaces for tourism, leisure, and intellectual contemplation during uh, between 1820s to the 1960s. Um, I distinguish between historical architecture and monument, and I try to write about how physical modifications, um, including landscape design, um, museum displays, postcard stalls, and the eviction of refugees transform them into modern touristic monuments uh, that signify state authority and national glory. Um, and I argue that these spatial and experiential forms of knowledge also produce the monument as social, cultural, physical entities. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that becoming a monument uh, is, is basically being grasped and apprehended uh, happens through material processes that define a site's function as purely touristic. And this occurs simultaneously with activities that resist, disrupt, and reveal the violence of state authority, um, which I'm calling the unbecoming of monuments. So um, I uh, rely on James C. Scott's uh, formulation of Hitler, uh, of, from his book, Domination and the Arts of Resistance, and I say that Non-elite figures transgress state authority by breaking rules within the monument precincts, occupying sites as non-tourist subjects, refusing to leave, unsettling the tourist experience, and objecting to land acquisitions. So this resistance, I'm arguing, manifests through subtle everyday actions that James Scott has called hidden transcripts, rather than loud protest. These forces destabilize hegemonic narratives instead of providing a scaffolding for them rendering them uh, unruly and unassimilable as modern national <coughs> monuments. Um, and in this, I'm investigating how archaeologists, tourists, British viceroys, monarchs, the military, independent India's government, postcard creators, filmmakers, European women, farmers, refugees, mosque custodians, museum displays, and even other marginalized people um, either aided in the becoming of the modern monument or resisted its existence. So um, broadly speaking, the destruction of monuments and the violent debates surrounding their ownership and use in India and the world over indicates like a pressing need to understand the longer history of how physical transformations to monuments have shaped narratives of place, possession, function, and identity. So coming uh, a little bit to con a contemporary moment, and even though I'm not really discussing the Taj Mahal, but I'm bringing it in as an example, 
Hindu right organizations have at times appreciated the aesthetics of Indo-Islamic architecture and claimed them by marking all sites popular on the tourist circuit as originally Hindu. Or conversely, they have e they have disowned them. So they either accept them and they say this is all Hindu, or they disown them and they say that they were constructed by foreign invaders um, and traitors and are not Indian and of no value. So in contemporary claims to these sites, I'm locating persistent remembering and in disowning them, I'm reading a desire to forget. So uh, the nation state must remember, fully grasp and control the Islamic monument in order to construct its glory and yet this very monument must also be erased in order to maintain the homogeneity of the nation as Hindu. Um, with a Hindu nationalist government in power today who according to a 2018 report quietly set up a committee to rewrite India's history in 2017, the narratives of the region's Islamic past um, are under imminent threat of further vilification and erasure. So um, it has been argued that monuments are created from residences, forts, or religious spaces when preservation bodies like UNESCO or ASI uh, legally protect the structures. So I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking in slightly different lines. I'm saying that while notification is the first step in monument making, um, I argue that it is physical transformations carried out at historical sites that bring modern monuments into existence, and I'm diverging by taking a materialist and a spatial approach and arguing that monument making is a physical, ongoing, and experiential process rather than purely a legal um, and representational one. But I also bring the physical and representational approaches into conversation um, for example, I try to uh, contextualize uh, the sale and use of postcards with actual lived experiences of tourists. And I also, although the image is not on the screen, but I also talk about um, 1950s patriotic films um, which represent uh, monuments um, alongside in the context of the Indo Park um, partition. So, um, Current scholarship also states that you know moving away or eschewing object studies reveals non-elite histories, but I'm trying to think of it as that it is indeed a close reading of objects, landscape, museums, postcard, refugee camps, and films that illuminate the marginalized. Uh, monument making like nation building is, a, is akin to the process of creating an archive um, that can recollect only uh, through forgetting. So, here I borrow from Derrida's archive fever. They say official archives, that is repositories of books, documents, images, and objects, shape the majoritarian narratives of the nation and the monument. And while the archive is ostensibly a place that recollects, as Derrida has argued, um, he also says that it can only do so by forgetting other voices. The archive, like the nation and the monument, is founded upon exclusion. I locate the persistent remembering and forgetfulness that characterizes uh, archive making in a variety of practices that define monuments. So first, I, um, I explore physical processes such as landscaping, you know, museum building and eviction of non-elites and so on. Um, I also um, look at how cinematic and spatial design um, exclude and you know, remember certain types of histories. Um, and then importantly, um, I instead of looking at the archive as a noun, I try to turn to the archive's inherent characteristics, which is remembering and forgetting. So I move our focus to how the archive makes and does. So in this expanded field, the verb archive making includes physical changes, display practices, and experiences and actions at the site. So here I'll just give a quick overview of what the different chapters are. So the first chapter unfolds the curious creation of a 19th century picturesque English landscape by colonial authorities around the Kutub Mosque complex, uh, 12th to 14th century Mosque complex, and it talks about how it shapes it as a modern monument, while also producing resistance against it by farmers, Muslim clerics, and local inhabitants. Um, and then I look at on-site colonial and post-colonial museums at the 17th century Mughal Red Fort. Um, and I talk about how the site was emptied of its Islamic signifiers and archived anew as a modern monument, um, revealing the state's inability to actually narrate its Mughal past effectively, even while claiming to do so. Um, the third chapter I look at, uh, I contextualize postcard imagery within anxiety-ridden actual lived experiences of conflict between tourists and custodians and so on. 
um, and I juxtapose that with the idyllic souvenirs, um, and I talk about how the postcards do not simply help remember, but they also um, help forget. Um, and then in the fourth chapter, I look at a time when one of the mo when several monuments in Delhi became refugee camps um, during the partition, this particular, the 16th century old fort. Um, and I talk about the refugees' refusal to leave until eviction, forced eviction in 1963, and how that became transformed it into a space of resistance. And I talk about how at a time of exchange, um, the potential from resistance came from something that actually couldn't be exchanged, which is these physical um, monuments. And the very last chapter actually moved to film and actually zoom out from Delhi. Um, and I you know, talk about uh, you know, how the nation itself is destabilized by the power of unruly monuments. And I contrast two films, one uh, from India, Jagriti, and which <coughs> another one from Pakistan, Bidari, which is, they're just copies of each other. Uh, they're made in the 1950s, they mimic each other, and traveling to monuments is a, good, is a way in which good citizenship is manifested in the film. So what I try to say is that revealingly both ignore their shared Islamic past, Jagruti and Bidari, they absent it, they, they have no mention of these Islamic monuments, even though traveling to monuments is a big deal in the film. Um, and I show that just as refugees evaded violence through sartorial obfuscation during the actual violence, the Indo-Islamic monument evades categorization as Indian or Pakistani and remains unassimilable in the National Archive through filmic absence.